Hello, dear listeners. Welcome to the ECM podcast. I'm Caroline Fontagneux, and I'm very happy to host this series that will take you behind the scenes of new music on ECM Records. In this fourth episode, I'm meeting pianist, band leader, composer, educator, and writer Vijay Ayer. For this interview, we met in the heart of Manhattan, Central Park, and talked about his new trio album called Uneasy, which was recorded with Linda Meano and Taishan Sori in New York and co-produced by Manfred Eicher. Vijay talks about his relationship with the trio and the playful virtuosity and connection between the musicians, the repertoire of this project and the unease that this album is about. But first of all, I wanted to know how Vijay felt about getting back to the trio. I think it puts me in the foreground, maybe in a way that other projects don't. And it puts me in, particularly my relationship to the rhythm section, the rest of the rhythm section, kind of in the foreground. And so it puts all those relationships into a very clear focus. And that's something that has interested me, I guess, as, as long as I've been making albums. I mean, mm -hmm. my first album, 1995, I was 23, and a good amount of it was trio music. And it was stuff that I had worked on for a long time, um, trying to develop some different approaches to rhythm and counterpoint and um, form, all kinds of different things. And I was really inspired by piano trio music, like particularly Ahmad Jamal's music from the 50s, the Live at the Pershing and music like that. The Duke Ellington album with Max Roach and Charles Mingus called Money Jungle is another touchstone for me. Red Garland trio, <laughs> um, certainly Keith Jarrett trio. Uh, Lots of different piano trios, I guess, were formative for me in trying to like learn how to make music. And I guess um, there's something funny and kind of ambiguous about piano trio music because, you know, when I'm playing, if I'm playing in a group with a saxophonist or with some other horn players or something, then I can orchestrate things so that what is composed is a little is more apparent because there are unisons among different instruments, for example, and more clearly orchestrated material, you know, that's like, oh, sorry, you're hearing uh, people doing these exercises <laughs> right next to us here in Central Park. Um, but yeah, so like that question of orchestration sort of puts on display the composer as composer, you know. With the piano trio, it's all sort of um, flattened. So what's, what's composition and what's improvisation, what's form, and what's process, you know, what's like forming. Uh, all of that is, it's hard, you can't really very obviously tell things apart in that way. Yeah. Because of that, it, it sort of presents a lot of interesting, very specific questions. So I guess those are questions that have been meaningful to me for like more than half of my life. <laughs> and like, you know, since for I guess close to 30 years now that, uh, I've always been uh, very close to my heart and like close to my way of um, conceiving of what music is and what it does, what it is for. You know. And I think in particular, like my connection with drums, with drums and drumming, <laughs> and like, yeah. my, like that particular relationship, that axis for me is so meaningful, so important. Um, it's how I. It's actually what I, whenever I'm working with students, I draw their attention there in particular. Because often, you know, people think of what they're doing as playing over the drums rather than with and in and through. So I, I tend to think of it as like, I'm co-drummer, you know, I'm co I'm in the drums with the drummer, you know, I'm in, so that, that axis is so key to me in, in music making. It's sort of what 
in a way, it's the first thing that a listener feels when they experience the first moments of music. It's like that access before they even are aware of what's happening. It's sort of like that rhythmic relationship kind of um, gets into your body. And so that, that's been very key to me. And so when you, when you started thinking about this project and when you started getting ready uh, and gathering the repertoire, like you knew that you wanted to record with the trio. You, you knew that you wanted to write for the trio. You knew, like, you knew that it would be a trio uh, project. Or that came later. Well, what came first is the impulse to record with these specific yeah. musicians. It was really that Taishan and Linda and I had the chance to play some trio sets in 2019, and that's when it really was like discovery. We had played together before, usually supporting larger groups. We just had that this moment of realization that this, yeah. as a trio, had a very distinctive feeling that we wanted to capture and we wanted to preserve and want to explore more you know, and celebrate. So that was what came first and then it was like, okay, what should we play? What should we record? So like, then it was about curating repertoire that would highlight what's great about this band. You know, both in terms of like bringing in new material and drawing from things I had done in the past and things that I wanted to do, <laughs> that I wanted to do that weren't mine, you know, um, like Jerry Allen's piece and, and that, that version of Night and Day that Joe Henderson did. You know, when you take on a piece of repertoire that's not your own, sometimes it's about what it gives you, you know, it's about what, uh, what it demands of you and how it brings you somewhere higher, you know, it brings you somewhere that you haven't been before. Taishan Sore, um, I mean, you've known him for years. You, 20, 20 years. Yeah. And you were saying it earlier, you're so attentive to the relationship with the drumming. And with he, ha he feels like he has so much to say. He's so musical, obviously, but he's so <laughs> he has so much to say. It's fascinating. Oh, yes. um, how does this relationship is evolving? Well, it's been amazing to see him become the you know, universally beloved <laughs> composer that he is um, and really important like one of the most important artists of today you know? but also as one of the greatest drummers of living you know, on this planet <laughs> right now you yeah. know because like we've kind of grown up together I mean he, I'm nine years older than him but we've been in so much together we've been through so much together um, that we really just sort of trust each other you know like uh, we can we I know that he hears everything I play <laughs> I know that he will adjust to my mistakes <laughs> um, you know he's astonishing he's always been that way you know when I first met him I knew that this guy was like like no one I'd ever met you know in terms of the level of awareness musical awareness um, simple just like sheer technical ability uh, as a listener as a musical mind the deep perspective he has on form and on rhythm and time. And he has perfect pitch, he has total recall, he has all these things like he, he hears everybody as they are, you know. And he hears with such compassion. So um, I always feel like I'm with family. You know, that's how it feels. It feels, like, it feels familial. It feels like um, someone who knows you through and through and is not, you know, accepts you. And yet you. still challenging. And, and oh yeah, yeah, well there's always this kind of like rambunctious, um, thunderous energy. Uh, is Just because he's like exploding with ideas. And because he is, uh, he has a, you know, I guess it was described in that Downbeat article. He's like, he has this defiant 
streak, which um, I've, I adore about him. You know, this uh, the way that he pushes against and past <laughs> all frames that you put around anything. You know, the way he he exceeds any category, any simple idea that you might have about what's happening, the way he brings it somewhere higher every time. Does it feel like that with Linda May and how hearing her, for me, it feels like hearing her breathing. There's something so organic because you can feel this thing between you and, and Taishan mm. and, and Linda is not just like trying to. Well, I knew also with her from the very beginning when I first met her and first started playing with her, which is more than 10 years ago, that she also had the similar kind of acuity, like similar ears in terms of real perspective on everything that's happening, a real accurate sense of time. You know, she also has perfect pitch, so she's never mystified. <laughs> she's never guessing, you know, she always knows what's happening. And she hears very melodically, too. You know, so I just knew that we could, again, like, we can do anything together. I'm not, I'm never concerned about whether she's going to keep up with Taishan, say. Which I might be with many other bass players, actually. Like, it takes, like, a certain kind of um, fortitude, you know, to, to get into that rhythmic relationship with him. I mean, he's very supportive. He always, you know, someone, remember Mark Shim, who's the tenor saxophonist, is on Far From Over, the mm -hmm. sax Ted album. Um, he described Taishan's playing as all support, you know. So if you really tune into it that way, if you understand that actually what he's doing is moving with you, not moving against you, not trying to throw you off the deck of the ship or something like that. <laughs> he's not trying to um, do any harm. To anyone he's actually trying to carry us all somewhere higher and he's with us you know so like once you just accept that that that's actually what's happening it all actually falls into place yeah and she heard that she was able you know like we've had many chances to play together and they knew each other obviously yeah. yes yeah yeah and i remember what she was noticing in the <laughs> the way she described it when we were in the studio you know she was in a booth he was in a booth i was in the main room with the piano you know, we're interacting on headphones. I mean, you've seen the footage. And, you know, a lot of the time, we all have our eyes closed and we're just kind of tuning in by ear to what's happening. And she said, like, she kept being surprised, or not surprised by, but like kind of, anytime she had any moment of doubt, I remember she made this gesture that like, pointing in both directions at once and like this moment of synchrony where we would both, Taishan and I would both land together. Like, okay, yeah. It's still together, <laughs> despite how it might momentarily feel. So I think that feeling of like a, a kind of um, spirited and lively, even kind of rough and tumble togetherness, you know, and aliveness um, that uh, has also in the, at the heart of it, this real faithfulness, like an accuracy and a, and a care in terms of like, really being with each other and like listening very carefully to be with each other, to move together with each other. When you started gathering this repertoire, some tracks were written already, were from uh, older projects, uh, some were written for it. Was that part of the conversation with Manfred? How did you build this whole repertoire huh? of all those tracks up and easy? It was more for me about just uh, from my own perspective, how I felt we could sound good together. <laughs> you know? I mean, I knew in a way, like it almost didn't matter what I chose because I felt like they would make anything great. You know, I guess that process is always partly intuitive, which means that a lot of the choices are uh, submerged for me <laughs> like I can't exactly access why it felt like I should do tuba for example which is from 2003 or configurations which is from I wrote it in 1999 actually so like why those pieces um, 
it felt right. Like some, I had some flash of intuition. Like this felt like we could make it really speak in a new way. Some of it was like I knew that Taishan knew all of it. Like he had played all of that music before. <laughs> That's helpful. At some point, <laughs> or at least had heard it. And anything he hears, he knows. Like that's how he is. I'm not exaggerating. <laughs> like something he heard 22 years ago, he knows right now. Like that's how it is. <laughs> I laugh because it mystifies me. But this is just a truth about Taishan Sori. So. I knew that we could just bring anything back into and, and re-instantiate it and make it new, you know? Well, there was like a spectrum I wanted to cover with this band, like on the one hand, a certain kind of depth and grandeur that, uh, I don't know, like entrustment or tuba certainly, they can access, they can just basically tap into the deepest currents in this music, you know, and, and like make them speak the, the kind of like the the drama of it, the, the struggle, the tragedy, you know, that gave rise to this whole history of this music, you know. And then also the, the nobility of it. So the, that side of things. And then on the other side, there's a certain, like, just playful virtuosity that they're both just able to conjure at a moment's notice, you know. Whether it's about navigating the maze that Joe Henderson made out of night and day or the rhythmic complexity counterpoint of Jerry Allen's piece or that piece configurations of mine which is just really hard it's just hard it took me <laughs> took me years I mean I wrote it in 99 we recorded it in 2001 and then I'm still working on it now like 20 years later so so in a way it's kind of like well this here's another crack at it like let's try again let's make it let's see what we can discover today in this piece so I guess all of those things, you know, the, uh, and then with a plaintive kind of piece like Children of Flint, which has this like, uh, there's a hint of sorrow in it, you know? But there's also a, a sense of like, um, it's for children. So you like want it to kind of have uh, a, uh, a tunefulness and a kind of, um, there's a care that's like a, even a quiet, that's uh, a gentleness that's that it's that they give to it that's about well they're both relatively new parents so they know that feeling of like welcoming a new life and caring for it and protecting it and that kind of thing so i think all of that um, that speaks through both of them that they were all you know i just wanted to capture that whole spectrum project in your album when you're recording when you're working on the sequencing and Tristment is very special track was it obvious for you that you wanted to, to close the album with it well I had experienced closing concerts with it um, yeah uh, I mean I didn't know actually well, I was back and forth with Manfred about this sequence that was one thing that he he and I um, we negotiated, you know, like he had a perspective on how to begin and he and I had a perspective on how to end. And then eventually they, we clicked them all together like Legos. <laughs> you really wanted to open with combat reading, right? I did. And uh, I still feel like that piece also kind of has this iconic status on the record as like this real authentic introduction of the trio sound in this like powerful way and it covers this really interesting spectrum. But it's also, um, it's nice to ease the listener into it. And so the way he described it, I remember the word he used, he said, how about we start with Children of Flint? I think it gives the whole album more elasticity. That was such an interesting way to put it. And I've actually pondered that for some time since then. That was, you know, now almost a year ago, <laughs> last summer. And what that means, like what does that mean for an experience to have elasticity, to have, uh, openness, a sort of flexibility, a fluidity, a sense of um, not too imposing right off the bat, you know, to basically welcome the listener in, guide them into the experience. And I've noticed this about how each of the albums has begun. It's always a conversation with him, but he likes to start 
gentle before you lead them into the vortex. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I understand sense. it does make sense. It does. It's um, it's the grown-up way. And actually, I'm I'm very happy with the whole shape of the album, the way it kind of divides into these halves. It's like a bright half and a dark half almost. Is sort of how I hear it, how I experience it. <clears throat> um, so it's like you know, it feels complete in that sense. DJ Ayer, from Central Park, New York, about his new ECM record, Uneasy. Thank you for joining, choosing, and listening to our ECM podcast. I'm Caroline Fontagneux, and I look forward to sharing more music with you in the next episode.